Get in the know. Non-stop Vikings talk. It's Purple Daily on Score North and ScoreNorth.com. Purple Daily, presented by Surly Brewing Company. All right, welcome into kind of an emergency Friday-ish, happy hour-ish episode. I got to be honest, I was aggressively napping. Like, you know, we wrapped our week. We uh, we were ready to ready to roll into the weekend, it. and all of a yep. sudden, the Vikings come out with two finalists for their general manager spot. Never can let your guard down when there are positions to fill at TCO Performance Center. Did, did you say happy hour? Oh wow! Look at that! Wow! Just I might I might be it. working, <laughs> but I'm on the clock. When it comes to Surly Furious. That's right. Purple Daily presented by Surly Brewing Company and TCL. Great TVs for watching playoff football this weekend. TCL is coming in hot with a new lineup of award-winning TVs delivering the most entertainment with stunning resolution, all at an affordable cost. Enjoy more of the things you love with TCL, and you should always be drinking Surly when you're watching football. High-caliber, high-level playoff football that the Vikings aspire to at some point. We just want them to win a Super Bowl, and so let's uh, let's get into it here. Uh, according to multiple reports, the Vikings have identified Browns Vice President of Football Operations Quezzi Adolfo Menza and Chiefs Executive Director of Player Personnel Ryan Poles as the two finalists. They're going to interview, according to, uh, I think Doogie has this, I see the Star Tribune and Adam Schefter Um, Actually, the Star Tribune has them interviewing next week. Specifically, they're going to interview on Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Mm -hmm. And I believe Mensa is coming to Minneapolis on Tuesday. Is Poles also coming to Minneapolis on Wednesday? I think the plan is for both both of them this time to be in town after doing Zooms for the first eight, um, first round of eight. Okay. And so really interesting candidates here. These guys are both under the age of 40. They come from very different backgrounds and I think bring very different perspectives. And I actually spent part of the afternoon just watching press conferences and videos with these guys. Uh, Adolfo Menza, the, the, the Browns will trot him out once in a while, like on draft day. They draft like they draft a speedy wide receiver in the third round or whatever, and they say, all right, go talk to the media about this guy. Right. Great, pleasant, smart demeanor. Uh, before spending seven years with the 49ers, Adolfo Mensa worked on Wall Street trading energy derivatives. Who doesn't do that once in a while? I mean, that's what I I've like been to doing do that in my spare time. Just yeah. on the side for about five years now. Me I too. I really it's enjoy great. it. Yeah. What's your favorite energy derivative? Oh, um, you know, I, I so many. To talk there are. About. It's, it's so really. Many, I, I struggle right now. <laughs> I feel like that, that will be on our our podcast that breaks down, of course, the art of the energy derivative. <laughs> yeah, we'll do a, yeah, we'll do, there's so much to get into there. We'll just energy do a bonus derivative podcast. So he worked in football research and development for yep. San Francisco. And then the Browns hired him to join uh, Andrew Barry's front office in a higher level and more influential role. And polls comes from more of a traditional football background. He was a left guard at Boston college, um, and then he went and spent the last 13 years in the Chiefs front office. So he's been with the same organization, just climbing up the ladder behind the scenes. And uh, and he had a pretty big hand in revamping and building the Chiefs offensive line. And you know we've talked more about polls, I think, on the show than Mensa. Sure. But you know my the to me the best case scenario for polls is he knows how the how the Chiefs sausage is made and what the secret sauce is there. But Mensa brings this like one of the things that really struck me. He talked about in one of his interviews how much his entire professional and personal life, how much he loves decision making yes. during uncertain times. Not yes. like these uncertain times, but like Wall Street, you're picking stocks, you're picking, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're trying to figure out what, you know, it, there's uncertain variables in drafting football players in in picking stocks, right? right. Collecting information and and putting your money, so to speak on the thing that you think is going to grow and be the best. And uh, and he thinks about football evaluation very analytically. So I don't know, what are your thoughts on these two finalists, Judd? So first of all, I'm very intrigued. But just to be clear, like we know what we've read, but it's hard to have real big opinions because like we don't know. I, I hadn't heard of, of 
either of these guys until the process started. So it's not like a coach where I, I might have biases or say, yeah, that guy did a great job there or what the hell happened. That being said, I'm intrigued by both. And my feeling on Adolfo Mens is this. I think if you want a ceiling that could be incredibly high, but also risk from the unknown, he's your choice. Because, I mean, he seems incredibly smart. I like what he does, but, like, I can't sit here and just say, yeah, this is going to be perfect. We don't know that. Um, when it comes to polls, what intrigues me is is the background that we have about him. So he, he was, I believe, the year that the Chiefs in 17 made the trade with Buffalo to move up and take Patrick Mahomes. He was the director of college scouting. And played a massive role. Now, he didn't pull the trigger, but he played a massive role in saying this is going to work. Um, and and I think now we all say, well, Judd, of course, it it's Patrick Mahomes. Shut up. But at that time. Yeah, he was that, that took not, some guts. A, not a sure thing. Had that, to that be took mold. some guts. Yep. Absolutely. The other thing the polls did, and this is more recent, but if you're the Vikings, no less important is he played a major role in the last couple of years, and especially last April, Phil, in helping the Chiefs in one offseason rebuild the O-line. They signed Thune to the big free agent contract, and that was important. But they also took um, uh, Creed Humphrey, a center, in the second round, and he started every game and was fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. And then, and then in very Spielman like fashion, they took Trey Smith in the sixth round. So three rounds after Wyatt Davis went, okay? And he started every game at right guard. <laughs> the point being is that's attractive. Like he ba he basically played a role in doing things that the Vikings have struggled with. To do now, Adolfa Mensa sounds like an incredibly smart guy, and I'll say this again: the ceiling could be incredibly high. Like he could be the genius of geniuses. I don't know, um, but it does intrigue me that you got a guy from the Chiefs who played an instrumental role in drafting one of, if not the best QB in the league today, who rebuilt the line, which had to be rebuilt. Um, and so I think there's more certainty there. Yeah. You know, um, in doing some digging on Mensa, because he's probably the candidate that there's like the least information about. I don't for know one, he for doesn't sure. have a Wikipedia page. There's conflicting reports about whether he graduated from Princeton early, whether he's in his mid 30s. Oh, or... I didn't see that part about Princeton. <laughs> so he played hoops. At yeah. I, so I so we'll find out like more biographical information. But I went back and watched probably like an hour's worth of just press conferences you can find stuff on youtube and the internet where i like to get a feel for how someone speaks to other people like these are very sure. these are very frontal jobs these aren't this isn't just like lock yourself into a film room and don't interact with people right like mm -hmm. like you and especially after what the players have said about mike zimmer and the fear-based culture like you, you need people that are personable and so can they lead? Are they personable? Can they bring a group of scouts and players and coaches together and, and share the same vision? And so, you know, the, just even the way that he spoke very respectfully to media, but very confidently, I, I you know, again, it's an hour sample size. I haven't right. been in the room with a guy. I haven't, right. uh, I haven't broken bread at Manny's downtown Minneapolis like they're probably going to do on Tuesday night next week. Um, but he said something. They brought him on a conference call during the 2021 draft to talk about Auburn wide receiver Anthony Schwartz, who the Browns drafted 91st overall in the third round. And, uh, you know, he only played, he only had like 10 catches this season. So, you know, they didn't do a lot with him, but he has a, he run, he ran a 4 2 or a 4 2 5 40 yard dash. Sure. And I remember his name kind of popping up when we were talking about Vikings weapons, like, God, if they could get a guy like this and, and somebody said, you know, hey, how do you sort of evaluate a guy with four two five speed, but maybe he lacks in some other areas? And Adolfa Mensa's answer was, it reminded me of the Vikings' struggles to get Kene Wangwu on the field. He said, put it this way, 
if we can't find a way to get a guy with a 4240 on the field creatively, then we're not doing our jobs. Mm-hmm. Now they only find, they only targeted this dude 23 times the whole season. But I like that. I like like the way that he thinks about it is let's draft talented players, potential hidden gems and then let's find creative ways to get them on the field. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not the only GM candidate that thinks that way, but I feel like we're coming out of this era of Vikings football where Mike Zimmer, this is my way. We look for these types of players. The entire third round will not play because I am Mike Zimmer, right? Like it's so rigid. Mm-hmm. And I think it's what irritated Stefan Diggs. I think it's what's irritated a lot of the current players. And so it just seems like Mensa is very flexible in the way that he talks about roster construction and and player development. I'm a little bit concerned that we don't know more though. So so like that that's where that's where my point is the he might be great, but like I wish we knew a little bit more. I I, yeah. I wish we had more. And with polls, I feel like we do have more and it's impressive. So just trying to to guess right now, spitball this polls impresses me because he has he has definitely i think beyond a shadow of a doubt been involved in fixing some of the things the vikings desperately need to fix um also where mens is coming from because he does seem incredibly smart but sometimes smart people have ideas of what they think they can do and want to do and then once they get in place it becomes tougher um i just I feel like Poles, while being a little bit more of a football-y football guy, also has a little bit more that you can sink your teeth into as far as, as his past and say, yeah. that's impressive. And look, to me, the most important thing is this. The starting point, if I have a list of 10 things, and there's a, lo- there's a lot of this that's important, but if I have a list of 10 things, Phil, that I'm going to list off that I want, one of my top three, can you find and can your staff find and develop a quarterback. Mm-hmm. That is just so important. And and Poles definitely was involved. And look, Reed deserves a ton of credit. That they percolated uh, uh, Mahomes perfectly. So like, there's a ton of credit to be passed around. But Poles was definitely in the front end and involved in in cultivating a guy who they did right by. And mm-hmm. that's that to me is is impressive. And there's just 100 percent evidence of what the chiefs did and that's what you want and you know this is where again like unless we're in a room with these guys for a few hours it's kind of we're kind of throwing darts here but i don't think you can choose a franchise quarterback using analytics as your base and i'm not saying that adolfa mensa would do that i think just because he comes from more of a wall street analytical background and the browns were definitely the browns had paul d podesta the longtime baseball executive in their front office like the Browns definitely went all in on the analytics side, but I, I think quarterback. Like yes, there are certain things you have to have analytically or physically, right? You got to be able to make certain throws. You know, there's there's definitely certain things that you can weed out the guys that have no chance. But at a certain point, it's about leadership. It's about mentality. It's about quickly processing information. It's about staying calm during moments of football crisis, and mm-hmm. those are things that. You have to get a feel for independent of numbers in a box score or a spreadsheet. Those are things that you like. You get a feel for in a conversation or or observing a quarterback interacting with teammates, right? So you know which one of these guys would have the better chance. Well, let's be honest. Ryan Poles was part of an organization that identified those things in Patrick Mahomes, and Adolfo Mensa came along after the Browns landed on Baker Mayfield, so he has nothing to do with that fail of a draft pick. Uh, San Francisco, I mean, in the seven years he was there between 2013, Kaepernick had already been drafted. And then after that, they were kind of in like a quarterback spin cycle, right? Like right. They, they wound up trading for Jimmy Garoppolo. Right. But in, in the seven years he was with San Francisco, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think it was before the Trey Lance pick. They didn't really take a shot at a franchise quarterback. So Not that I recall. Yeah, not a disqualifier for him, but no. And polls, um, and this... This probably was tough to go through, but is impressive. Poles survived two major shakeups there and was kept, mm-hmm. which to me is important. Like like that speaks it I think more of of the fact that Brzezinski has survived 
shakeups here. Like it does not make make me say, why does he not get fired too? Yeah, no, no, it's we like know he does new, a great job. New people come in and they're like, all right, we're like our default stance is we're probably going to get rid of almost everyone, and Correct. then they're like, oh wait, but that guy's really smart. Correct. Let's keep that guy. And yeah. polls polls survived and got promoted, and I I think that's impressive, especially especially when the uh, staff that's in place there now is really good. Yeah. So they saw that and said, hold on a second here. This guy's good. Um, so just from what we've read and seen, to me, his background is, it screams to me that he's, that I looks like he's definitely, definitely, it looks like he's prepared for the job. Adolfa Mensa might be, but I don't know. What what does it mean to you that Ryan Poles was a finalist for the Carolina GM job a year ago and a finalist this week for the Giants GM job? Um, it means to me that that he's on the precipice, like like he's going to get this job or the next job. Now, Adolfa, Mensa, and Poles were both finalists for the Panthers job last year. Um, Adolfa Mensa was not in on the Giants job. But yeah, I think it means that that he's close, that he's close, and and you know, Phil, there just come and there also comes a point in time where you start to say, did he not get the job because he didn't deserve it, or is the fallback of well, I knew this guy, and you know, I, there's just a lot of things, I- including mm-hmm. uh, race here. So, Paul strikes me in what I've read about him as being the exact type of guy that. If I'm a team, I want to give a chance to, because my question is, un- unless you dig up something on background, which I don't think you're going to do, uh, but if you dig up something on background that's damning, that's one thing. But I think in a lot of these cases, it is it is the guy deserves it, and he stri- I mean, this strikes me as a guy who deserves his shot, and I don't know how much more a guy like that can do in his current job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So uh, the, the next question here, and again, it's going to be really hard for us to answer this. Um, you know, I think there's one interesting connection here, but do these two finalists tip the hand at all of who the next head coach is going to be? I mean, keep a couple things to keep in mind here. The Vikings have been doing their own head coach interviews while they've simultaneously been narrowing down to these two finalists for GM. Sure. I'm sure in the discussions, names have come up. I'm sure they've been cross-referencing names on their list. Mm-hmm. Ryan Poles obviously has been working with Eric Bieniemy in Kansas City for a number of years. Bieniemy has not yet been interviewed by the Vikings, but you know, once I mean, immediately today, once the Giants hired the assistant GM of the Buffalo right. Bills, the first two head coach interviews he lined up were the coordinators in Buffalo right. for this weekend. Exactly. So I mean, if they hire Ryan Poles, I have very little doubt that. Eric Bannemi is going to get an interview with the Vikings, mm-hmm. and then it'll come down to what does Ryan Poles really think of Eric Bannemi? That's the closest connection that he has. Um, Adolfo Mensa, he did spend a year with Kevin O'Connell in San Francisco in 2016, who is the offensive coordinator for the Rams right now, and he's one of the eight candidates for head coach. But um, that was one year. Kevin O'Connell was listed as a special projects coach, so he didn't. Yeah. You know, he was just kind of there for a minute. I, again, I don't know if those maybe those guys formed a lifelong friendship and a bond. I, I, I guess we'll find out. But I, I mean, I, this is just speculation here. But it would seem odd to me that young, sort of fresh-minded, up-and-coming GMs, especially one with an analytical background, right, would go old school at head coach. Right. I, I guess I would be shocked if like. Todd Bowles, who just interviewed, or Dan Quinn became the Vikings head coach based on these GM finalists. But I don't know. I'm willing to see well, what happens here. And I, I guess the question that we don't know um, what the answer is going to be is this. Does this group of seven have an agenda with the coaching list where they are going to pick a young GM, give him four names, and say, pick? Or, or at least help us pick. Like we don't know. Can uh, um, can guys come come in now once they get the job and say, "Hey, I'm adding three names." The one thing here is, we're talking about young people. 
32, 36, uh, who are finally getting their opportunities. So there's a chance that that two things. One one is they're going to want to do their most to please their new bosses. So if they get they get a list of four, there's a very good chance that they're not going to throw up their hands and be like, this is BS. I didn't take that. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and this is a very football sports thing, Phil, is if you hire a young GM, would young GM be told, you know what, you're young. What we need is a veteran coach. I'm not condoning that. I'm yeah. not saying that's smart. But, but they got to be on the same page. You, I, know? you can't have one completely. guy. You can't have one guy that views the football world like a I Mike know. Zimmer, and then another guy who views the football world, uh, you know, like like you know a what? young Wall Street ace. So <laughs> we also don't don't know this, and it's an incredibly important question. And and the Vikings are going to do their best not to tell us, but we don't know where control of the roster is going to lie. I, I mean, Childress as coach had it Frazier and Spielman for a year or two split it, which was a terrible idea. Yeah. And then Rick got it. So like, we don't know if, if they're go going to name, you know, polls coach and say, okay, but here's the deal. We love, take your pick Dan Quinn. We love Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn's our guy. And he's go going to have ultimate say on the roster. Again, I'm not condoning that. I think it's a bad idea. But we don't know that. By the way, that's kind of how it used to be. I was I actually heard uh, I heard uh, Dave Wanstead on a podcast earlier this week, and he was a coach all throughout the 90s, and he always had full control. He wasn't like a Hall of Fame coach. He was a good coach. But it was more common like 20, 25 years ago for the GM in the front office to kind of work for the coach. Yeah, Green had it. Yep, yep. Green was the sort of the de facto GM Very for much. a couple of years at the end of his career. Very much. But I think – I think it depends on who the head coach is. Like if Doug, if if they land on Doug Peterson, Doug Peterson's going to want control over the roster. And based on the way things fell out at the end of his Philadelphia run, right? Like he had a huge falling out with the front office. They disagreed on a bunch of things, and he's he's going to say, "Guys, I, I love the opportunity, but I'm sorry, you know, especially if you're going to you're going to hire a first time GM under the age of forty. Like all due respect, I, I'm going to love working with you, yeah. but I'm going to." I'm I I'm in my fifties. This is probably my my real shot. I hate that though. I hate that. I be because the coach is never going to do the right thing by by the team for for the long term. The coach yeah. is always going to do short term. We can win now, and it's like yeah, no, you really can't. Um, the the GM might get mad. But he's got, but he sits at a desk and can sort of calm down, right? And make a decision and be, be like, man, I, I was irrational there. I am not going to do X, Y, or Z. I feel like the coach gets mad and it's like, I can do something right now. And they can't calm down, calm, be calm down. And then like the GM can go to the coach and say, hey, don't do that. But the coach says, bleep off. I've yeah. got control of the roster. So, but that's, that is going to be an incredibly important thing and i will i will say this if you are 32 or 36 and you get this job i don't think you're going to go to the wall and say if i don't control the roster i'm out i think yeah. you're going to say thank you very much uh ziggy and mark i really appreciate this job what can i do for you yeah i think just one last thought on the coaches here i think eric the chances just went up even though they haven't put him on a list yet. Uh, I think uh, they just interviewed Todd Bowles. So they've, the Vikings put out a little social media graphic that they've completed their interview with Todd Bowles and Raheem Morris is scheduled today. Uh, just based on his demeanor and the way that players gravitate toward him, I think, and, and his, he's a pretty young still Raheem Morris is 42. I could, but he has experience. Like I could really see yeah. Raheem Morris's stock climbing here in the next few days. Yep. Uh, I don't know what to Good. think about the Dan Quinns, the Doug Petersons. You know, they they have not spoken with Byron Leftwich, and there's some rumblings that maybe he's just headed to Jacksonville when it's all said and done. Mm -hmm. um, and Doug Peterson, it's kind of a mystery as to where things stand with him. Don't you think if either one of these guys gets the job, that if they have their choice, they are not going to pick a defensive, defensive guy? 
Like yeah, Dan, well, and, and, and Cle- think about like this. They're trying to find quarterbacks, right? San Francisco went to the Super Bowl, and, and Adolfo Menza was, was still with San Francisco in 2019 when they went to the Super Bowl. Yep. Offensive-minded Kyle Shanahan, right? Yep. 13 years of Ryan Poles in Kansas City. A large chunk of that. Andy okay. Reid, offensive-minded guy. And then, of course, Mensa comes over to Cleveland. Kevin Stefanski, offensive-minded guy. So really, Correct. like, all those guys have known in their careers is offensive-minded head coaches. And it might not be fair, but, I, but I'm but i guessing from the background of both of these guys that they have both been – were grilled on quarterback play, right? And so – it would be weird to get the job and then and then have um, the group of seven turn around and say, but we think that you should go with a real defensive coach, you know, Dan Quinn yeah. and go. So it, I would think that if they had their choice and, and the proper influence on the selection of the coach, that odds would be very strong. It, it would be a guy that would skew offense and, and start there and then bring in a DC who could shore things up for that side of the ball. Yeah. Yep. No, that's uh, so there it is. Two finalists here as we sit here on this Friday emergency episode. Big stuff. Quesi Adolfo Mensa and Ryan Poles, one of those two guys, barring some weird uh, WWE like run in, will be the new Vikings general manager. And it'll probably happen. So the interviews again are Tuesday and Wednesday next week. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing they're going to be pretty snappy after that in Thursday deciding. Or Friday. Yeah, so by the end of next week, the Vikings yep. will have a new GM, and then however long it takes after that to finalize the coach. I'm going right now, Poles. You? I think Poles is the favorite. He's more experienced. He's been a finalist already this week for a job, so I think there's some I think there's some urgency on him. Like, oh, other other teams, you know, it's like he's kind of the hot commodity here that is is knocking on the door. Right. But I honestly, like, it's either one of these guys is going to be such an interesting and refreshing new look at drafting and personnel here i'll give you one more thing here when there's plenty more to talk about next week but what bothers me the most about rick spielman's roster construction and i think he leaned into mike zimmer on some of this too because zimmer's fingerprints are all over this roster oh yeah definitely they allocated so much money and so many resources to secondary positions not like literally secondary but like safety we love Harrison Smith, and that's great. But at one point, they were paying Anthony Harris and Harrison Smith like a combined $24 well, million. Dollars. They screwed that pooch on that one for they've, sure. They've poured money into safety, linebacker, running back. Yep. And they have neglected offensive line. At times, yep. they've neglected yes. quarterback, or they've or they've poured too much money into a non-elite quarterback, right? Like the, I, I just don't love the way that they've gone about roster construction and and cap allocation in some ways. And and that goes back to Adrian Peterson too. Like they were they were paying Adrian Peterson twice as much money as the second highest paid running back like 6 years ago. So yes. stop pouring money into safety linebacker and running back at the expense of other positions in 2022 NFL. And once you settle on your QB as well, do everything that you can to help him. Yes. Don't sabotage him. And yes. I don't care if we like him or not. Like, like that's beside the point. Um, Kirk Cousins, what was essentially signed, and look, he he could have he could have done a far bit better job of like having a feel for the room. The coach didn't like him. That's a red flag. But all of that being said, you know, Rick Rick went out and and got the big fish, and then he put like ketchup on it. Which I love ketchup, which, but he put ketchup on. Yeah, you I would, would do, that. do that, but I'm sort of a slob. Uh, but <laughs> like, that's the thing is, if you're going, when you make that commitment, do everything that you possibly can to make that part of your team successful. Don't yeah. go out and draft, you know, Bradbury, who's turned out to be a complete bust. Uh, plug in a guard who was a tackle. Like that makes that literally makes no sense. Well, they did the same thing with Teddy Bridgewater. They drafted a first round quarterback seven, eight years ago, and they made him run the Adrian Peterson offense, right? The the I formation under center. It's like this dude spent his entire college career in shotgun and pistol, and they said, oh, okay, you're right. now you're part of this yeah. offense, and this is how we run the offense. It's and, like, the and, and, and they you're put right. a crappy offensive line in front of him too but you're, for the most part. 
That's a great point. So Bridgewater, Cousins, like, all right, we got the, the guy. We got the quarterback. Now you're going to have to right. deal with all these you're sort right. of you opening, know, you know, cognitive op- dissonance. Opening day, opening day, you run the, this is Peterson's, this is what he prefers. What, what are you doing? Yeah. What, yeah. Why That's a great keener? point. But yes, but, but they need to, it, it should not even have to be a conversation that, that you need to get who, who your quarterback is going to be a, a support structure, a structure that's going to make sense. Cause that's the one thing these guys didn't do. And I'll never understand like that to me, absolutely a recipe to be fired. Yep. So, and by the way, Ryan Poles, I mean, you know, the Vikings have done a horrible job finding and developing offensive linemen for the last 10 years or so. I mean, he literally was an offensive lineman yeah. at a power five school. And it's, I, I'm assuming it's probably the, the peak of his expertise I, is building offensive line. I so. can't wait. And it should be soon. I can't wait for the term. We're a zone blocking team to be gone. <laughs> yeah. First of all, the true zone blocking, like it's you still, but like the true, like Alex Gibbs zone blocks that's the late uh late 90s broncos it is no well, it's like what do you know no get fat guys it's like literally 1997 yeah but i mean you could get if you want your fat guys to run i'm cool with that <laughs> but like it's like we need we need guys that are smaller and can no do you know how big people are now yeah <laughs> gotta get to the second level yeah you but know? like you can't protect your quarterback on third down and eight that's okay your quarterback's level. dead. Your quarterback's lying there dead, but you're <laughs> at the second level. Congratulations. Yes. So, all right. Emergency episode here of Purple Daily, Daily Vikings Entertainment, Speculation Therapy, presented by Surly and TCL. And uh, let us know what you think. Who do you think? I think I think Poles probably has the, the edge here, but anything can happen when you, you get to think, the back so. room at Manny's. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, hit us up in the YouTube comment section and uh, click subscribe and the like button to help spread the word about this show. And we'll see you guys next time on Purple Daily.